All right, good morning, everyone. Um, I am Constance Benson. I'm uh, gonna talk this morning about COVID-19 as we've been trying to do with high rounds, alternating every other week with uh, new information about COVID-19 or new information about HIV. So today's uh, COVID-19 day <clears throat> and I'm gonna talk about clinical trials currently in progress at UCSD. I have no disclosures. Um, I'm, this is a brief outline of the discussion today. I'll be providing a little bit of an epidemiology update and a background on some of the antiviral and anti-inflammatory drugs that are currently under investigation. And then I'm gonna focus really on three clinical trials that were uh, are already underway or currently in the prog process of being started, although I will highlight a few other planned randomized clinical trials at the end. For those of you who attended the pulmonary critical care grand rounds yesterday morning, there will be a little bit of overlap, although I'm going into greater detail about uh, three of the clinical trials than was possible during yesterday's pulmonary and critical care grand rounds. So let's turn to a little bit of uh, background about novel coronaviruses. We've obviously heard a lot about the current one, but I think uh, I'd like to start because I think it's important for the background about antiviral therapy to highlight some of the background about other human coronaviruses. And as you know, this is our third major epidemic related to a human coronavirus. Human coronaviruses are positive stranded RNA viruses. They have a crown-like appearance due to these beautiful spike glycoproteins that are emanating from the surface. They have nucleotide identity with bat coronaviruses or SARS-like viruses, about 89% identity. And most of them cause common colds. They're self-limiting upper respiratory infections. And as you can see on the slide here, there's a host of them with different uh, names and numbers. But the ones that have caused the three most important epidemics are those that are it, hypothesized to have jumped from bats or other animals to humans and caused epidemics with variable clinical severity, primarily um, respiratory and some other organ system diseases. So SARS-CoV-1 was primarily an epidemic in Southeast Asia. MERS or Middle East uh, Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus, primarily in the Middle East in its most recent epidemic and now SARS-CoV-2, which is now a global pandemic. It's always interesting to look at how quickly the numbers jump and last just overnight, there have been big jumps in across the globe. So we're continuing to be on the uptake of new cases in many areas of the world. Well over 2 million confirmed cases globally and 147,000 deaths globally. I like looking at the Johns Hopkins website um, graphic because you can put your little pointer on some area and have that graphic um, highlight the country or the uh, area that you're um, pointing to and it will give you the update on numbers from that area. But the only point to be made here is if you see all the red dots on this global map, almost the entire United States is now covered in red. And as you all know, we have cases in every state in the US right now. Um, this is a global uh, update from the Worldometers Info website showing the uh, graphic depiction of daily cases and daily deaths. And what you hear on the news all the time, the fantastic uh, New York Times presentations every day pointing out when we're going to reach the peak and when we're going to flatten the curve. What they're really referring to is the total number of new daily cases and new daily deaths. And as you can see, we've reached what looks like an asymptote in the curve, but we're not yet going down as of April 15th. And there are sporadic uptakes across the globe, um, both in new cases and in daily deaths. 
looks like uh, April 13th was a bad day for deaths in general around the globe. This is the picture of the United or of California, and as you can see, we've started to level off in terms of new cases by day. Um, looking at the seven day average in this evened out curve. But again, we have spikes um, up and down periodically as well. But we've not yet leveled off in terms of the number of deaths each day in the state of California. And there's always a lag time behind new cases and deaths, obviously, based on the clinical manifestations of the disease. And then there's San Diego County, which also has a very nice graphic and a picture of the county where you can also click on the graphic and see how many places, how many cases there are in a particular zip code around the county. And as you can see, the vast majority of cases are in the western and middle to southern parts of the county with relative sparing of East County in terms of cases of coronavirus disease. So I wanted to talk a little bit about clinical manifestations. We've all heard ad nauseum, the screening symptoms that everybody asks you about when you come into the hospital or come into the clinic. And those screening symptoms are interesting across the globe. Um, although it's touted in many uh, publications that 80% of people have mild disease and mild pneumonia characterized by fever and fatigue and myalgias and a dry cough. There are a host of other symptoms that have been recognized now around the world. And the most interesting of these have been the symptoms of anosmia and dyscusia, meaning um, abnormalities of um, smell and taste. And many people around the globe are now reporting cases of asymptomatic or relatively asymptomatic COVID-19 disease characterized by a loss of smell or abnormal taste being the features that most people complain about if they have any symptoms at all. And we're now recognizing that a substantial proportion of transmission of disease now occurs in the early days before the onset of symptoms. And so this graphic, while it's a nice graphic about the onset uh, a timeline for the onset of symptoms to progression to more severe symptoms and then progression to critically ill disease and intensive care unit admission, there's a vast majority of people still fall on this one to 10 day course without ever making it to hospital admission, ARDS or intensive unit, intensive care unit admission. And over on the left side of the graphic, which um, now needs to be updated, there's a two to four day prodromal period where people have high replicating viral activity and the ability to shed virus but have no symptoms. And we now think that a good portion of our community uh, transmission is occurring from asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic people before they get to the onset of symptoms re relative to, co to COVID-19. So with that in mind, I wanna go over a little bit of the life cycle for SARS-CoV-2. And you might recognize, although the, the appearance of the virus looks somewhat different, this life cycle looks very similar to every other RNA virus that we're aware of, in particular for those of us who have been working in HIV all these years, looks a lot like HIV. There are um, these spikes on the surface of the virus, um, and S protein is the the featured protein that interacts with an angiotensin converting enzyme, enzyme 2 receptor on the surface of a host cell, in this case, an alveolar, a uh, pulmonary alveolar cell, and interacts with that receptor to allow entry of the virus into the cytoplasm of the cell where it undergoes uncoding, releasing an RNA that then, uh, a single stranded RNA that then undergoes. Um, translation, proteolysis, RNA synthesis, um, and then repackaging with structural proteins assembly and then exocytosis out of the cell. 
So many of the antiviral drugs that we use for treatment or that we propose to use for treatment of COVID-19 act at different places in this life cycle, just like we've learned with HIV antiviral therapies. Um, when the outbreak was first recognized in China, there was a substantial use of a number of antiviral agents that people had on hand. One is called Arbidol, which is a drug that's only available currently in China and Russia. It targets this S protein ACE inhibitor or ACE receptor interaction at the surface of the cell and inhibits membrane fusion of the viral envelope. In the early days of the Chinese epidemic, nearly every patient admitted to the hospital with symptomatic disease was treated with Arbidol. And uh, shortly thereafter, there was treatment with protease inhibitors, lopinavir, ritonavir, or darunavir, ritonavir. And early in the Chinese epidemic, um, uh, China uh, gathered all the available world supply of lopinavir, ritonavir, so, so that it was out of supply for a period of time during the Chinese epidemic. And many of the patients in the early Chinese, Chinese epidemic used a combination of Arbidol and lopinavir, ritonavir. I think we know now from the experiences of those um, treated patients in many observational and published experiences, those two agents had little effect on the overall course of the disease. We all know the story about chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, and I'll get to that in a moment, but further along in the life cycle is where remdesivir and favipravir and ribavirin come in. These are RNA-dependent RNA polymerase inhibitors and act at the RNA synthesis stage of the viral life cycle. And then we don't really have antiviral agents active against coronavirus in vitro or in animal models out in the later stages of the life cycle. There's also, which I will be discussing in one of our clinical trials, a body of literature emerging using uh, monoclonal antibodies that don't act directly or, or may have some indirect antiviral activity against the virus, but more importantly, interact with one of the pathogenic features of COVID-19 pneumonia, which is cytokine storm and the release of a large number of pro-inflammatory cytokines that exaggerate the human immune response to the virus and lead to some of the downstream effects of ARDS and respiratory failure and multi-organ failure. So with that background in mind, the first antiviral drug I'm gonna talk about in terms of clinical trials is remdesivir. You've all probably read the New England Journal uh, experience with the first uh, 67 patients or 57 patients with who were treated in an, the uh, emergency IND program by Gilead, suggesting that in an uncontrolled observational experience, about 70% of people treated, recovered, and did not progress to ICU care or mechanical ventilation. And among those who did progress to mechanical ventilation and ICU care, the overall recovery rate was about 50%. Um, that to me means a flip of the coin. 70% um, is about what the recovery rate is in hospitals to begin with. So it's hard to know what an observational experience with, that's uncontrolled means in the context of the activity of the drug, which is why we do uh, well-controlled clinical trials. So remdesivir, um, acts in the replicative cycle, as I alluded to earlier, here at the level of um, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase or replicase activity and acts as an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase inhibitor. It uh, is a prodrug of a nucleoside analog, which currently just has a number and has an effective concentrate concentration 50 of 0 0.137 to 0.77 micromolar against SARS-CoV-2 in vero cells in the laboratory. 
It also is a broad spectrum antiviral drug. It has activity against many members of phyloviruses, including Ebola and Marburg, and paramyxoviruses, including respiratory syncytial virus and Nipah and Hendra viruses. In a mouse model of SARS-CoV, the first SARS epidemic um, virus, coronavirus, it demonstrated prophylactic and therapeutic efficacy in the mouse model, reducing mortality and, and reducing lung viral loads, lung pathology, and although it's hard to know what clinical signs of pulmonary dysfunction you can recognize with a mouse, but seemed to reduce that. Also in uh, several monkey models, but the most promising of these was the rhesus macaque model, it also produced um, both preventive and therapeutic efficacy against MERS-CoV in both a mouse and a rhesus macaque model. And again, in the monkey models, reduced lung viral loads, lung pathology, and clinical signs of pulmonary dysfunction in the macaque model. So this is the genesis of the interest in remdesivir against SARS-CoV-2 and the combination of both the, model, the animal model and in vitro data against SARS-CoV-1 and the viral cell and in vitro data against SARS-CoV-2 make it a promising antiviral therapy for uh, proposing for treatment of COVID-19. It has been used in human clinical trials. Um, generally, a favorable safety profile has been reported. There have been more than uh, 500 patients treated in available and published data, although around the globe now, many more than that have been treated with remdesivir. In healthy volunteer phase one studies and in clinical trials of patients with acute Ebola disease and acute MERS disease. The treat major treatment emergent adverse events, or AEs, that have been reported in some of the early experience with remdesivir have been elevations in ALT and AST. The PK profile indicates that it has high and persistent levels of the active nucleoside triphosphate metabolized, metabolite intracellularly, and in studies that have looked at peripheral blood mononuclear cells, the T half, or the half-life of the active metabolite in PBMCs is 32 to 48 hours, and it reaches a Cmax of greater than 10 micromolar, so about tenfold higher than the effective concentration 50 for the virus. The plasma half-life is quite short. It's only available currently as an intravenous um, formulation, and the plasma half-life is about uh, two-thirds to one hour after the infusion. The drug is renally excreted. It is a CYP3A4 inhibitor, but because its plasma half-life is so short, it's not expected or in previous studies been shown to have significant drug-drug interactions um, with other CYP3A4 metabolized drugs, prim primarily due to this rapid clearance after intravenous administration. It is not an inducer, so it does not induce any enzymes or transporters. So the drug interaction profile is expected to be reasonably good for the, this particular agent. So what are we doing here at UCSD and what's the major uh, clinical trial currently underway around the globe? And this is um, DMID 200006, DMID standing for the Division of Microbiology and Infectious Diseases. So this is an NIH-sponsored clinical trial. The trial design is an adaptive, randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial of remdesivir given intravenously versus placebo. The inclusion criteria are relatively broad and listed here. Patients have to be PCR positive for SARS-CoV-2, have to have symptoms of at least three days duration, and at least one of the following, radiographic infiltrates um, on room air, um, oxygen percentage of less than 94%, or requiring supplemental oxygen or ventilation. Exclusion criteria are primarily fo focused on the liver. When we started off the study, um, 
patients had to have an estimated GFR of greater than 60. That has recently been relaxed, so people can have a lower GFR to enter the trial. And they want patients who are not anticipated to leave the hospital or transfer out of the hospital within 72 hours. And that's primarily so that we have enough of an experience or time on the infusion to reach steady state levels, which occur in three to four days. So the primary outcome of this study is time to recovery by day 29. And this outcome is based on one, reaching one of three categories, either still being hospitalized but not requiring supplemental oxygen and not requiring ongoing medical care for COVID-19. And this really refers to a category of people who are still in the hospital because of other things, not necessarily their COVID-19 pneumonia, or because they're still in isolation. The second category is not hospitalized, but having some limitation on activities of daily living or requiring home oxygen for support. And then the third category is fully recovered, not hospitalized, no limitations on activities. And there are ordinal categories being assessed for each of these outcomes with regard to recovery by day 29. So this graphic is the progression of enrollment in the trial. You can see we went from zero, literally zero to 60, zero to 60 days, reaching 950 patients enrolled, 915 patients enrolled at 60 sites in five different countries as of um, this morning, or last night at midnight, I guess. There are 18 patients currently enrolled at UCSD, and the study is planned now to close to enrollment for stage one at 12 midnight on April 19th. And this will be, this study will be undergoing a preliminary analysis aimed at analyzing 400 evaluable recovered patients. And that analysis will have at least 400 evaluable recovered patients reach an endpoint by May 8th, and we'll be undergoing that early analysis. So we may have data from this trial by May 8th. There may also be preliminary data from this trial earlier than that, because the Data Safety and Monitoring Board that has been monitoring this study is meeting on April 27th to, redo, to review the, data, the complete data from the first 200 evaluable recovered patients um, throughout the course of the study to that point. And depending on what their findings are, there may be earlier data released from this trial. The only other caveat I will say is that the randomized clinical trial of remdesivir that Gilead was sponsoring in China, the similar study design with placebo controlled, was stopped early, not because it met any endpoint, but because by the time they got the study ready to open and enroll in China, their epidemic had waned to the point that they could not enroll in a sufficient number of patients. So that study was stopped for futility. There may be um, safety data released from that trial shortly. And then there is a third um, Gilead-sponsored trial that was not placebo controlled, but compared a duration of therapy of five days versus 10 days for people with COVID-19 pneumonia. That study has also been halted, again, not for um, a signal being reached, but because um, they met criteria for enrollment. And there may be data uh, released from that study shortly, although the cautionary note there is that that study has no placebo controlled arm. So because this is an adaptive uh, trial design, it was set up intentionally for us to be able to look at the outcome with remdesivir alone compared with placebo. And if there were other um, promising agents coming along by the time the study was recruited, to be able to immediately add another arm to the trial, either to combine it with remdesivir or 
to compare it with remdesivir, removing the placebo if it turned out that remdesivir had activity. So this adaptive design um, could be adjusted either way. If remdesivir doesn't look good, it, there will continue to be a placebo arm and a new agent can either be swapped in or combined with remdesivir. And if remdesivir looks active, the placebo arm can be removed. The current plan for the study design is to add a second stage that will include baricitinib, and I'll talk about that in a moment, as part of a two-arm or potentially a two-by-two -two randomization to a four-arm trial, depending on the results of the preliminary analysis of the remdesivir placebo-controlled trial. Um, this portion of the study is scheduled to open in late April, maybe early May. Not clear when we're gonna open it at UCSD because I think our investigative team feels more comfortable waiting until we see the results of the original trial and we can catch up on the rapid um, emergence of data that really overwhelmed the, the study team at UCSD in terms of the rapidity of enrollment and the volume of work that the study has engendered among a lot of our staff. But be that as it may, if Act 2 opens as planned, it will include baricitinib in one of the arms. Baricitinib is a JAK1 and JAK2 inhibitor, which has, been, has an interesting history. It was identified through um, artificial intelligence and uh, modeling study as potentially useful drug for the treatment of SARS-CoV-2. If you wanna read more about the background of how that artificial intelligence modeling study emerged, the reference is at the bottom of the slide here. But it has um, interesting activities as a JAK in inhibitor. It inhibits cytokine signaling and has both anti-inflammatory and antiviral potential. This is a drug that's currently available in clinical practice. It's in use for treatment of autoimmune diseases, similar to to, um, tocilizumab. It's used by people with rheumatoid arthritis and other autoimmune diseases because of its cytokine signaling inhibition and anti-inflammatory properties. But relative to SARS, CoV-2, it also mediates through its inhibition of cytokine signaling, in mediates or inhibits endocyt the endocytosis property and thereby may interfere with viral entry. It also is involved in um, expression on ACE, the ACE2 inhibitor and may inhibit viral entry in that way too by um, altering the interaction between the virus and the ACE2 inhibitor. So it may have some antiviral properties. And then secondly, it's anti-inflammatory properties involved in cytokine signaling may also have an impact on the cytokine storm and inflammatory cascade that is engendered by um, the human immune response to the virus. It does have drawbacks like many of the monoclonal antibodies that we use for their anti-inflammatory properties. They can lead to immunosuppression. They can lead to serious infections when used in the long term. Obviously, the hope is that this will be a drug that we only use short term in combination with an antiviral therapy to inhibit the host immune response, the most severe of the host immune responses. So in that vein, I'll go on to talk about the other monoclonal antibody that is currently under investigation for its activity against SARS-CoV-2 disease, and that is tocilizumab. And tocilizumab, although it's a mouthful to talk about, and I always trip over my tongue mentioning the name, is a recombinant, recombinant humanized anti-human monoclonal antibody. It binds to soluble IL-6 receptor and membrane-bound IL-6 receptor and inhibits IL-6-mediated signaling. IL-6 
as you might recall from medical school or your uh, literature reading, is a pro-inflammatory cytokine with very broad based um, activity. It's involved in T cell activation, in induction of acute phase proteins, like C-reactive protein, which is elevated in people with SARS-CoV-2 pneumonia. It stimulates hematopoietic um, precursors of cell growth and differentiation, and has a host of other cell metabolic functions. IL-6 has been targeted early on because it was just like many other pro-inflammatory cytokines, is elevated, and in particular in those individuals who have the most severe forms of COVID-19 pneumonia with ARDS and cytokine storm, IL-6 levels have been particularly elevated in that component of, of individuals who have severe disease. And IL-6 elevated elevations of IL-6 are also implicated in some of the inflammatory and autoimmune disorders that it's used to treat, particularly rheumatoid arthritis, Castleman disease, um, systemic lupus, giant cell arteritis, and other um, cytokine release syndromes. In particular, it's been used for individuals with, who are undergoing cancer chemotherapy with CAR T cell um, agents because of their propensity for uh, cytokine release syndrome. Tocilizumab is often an adjunct therapy in CAR T cell treatment to try and inhibit that cytokine release syndrome. So the rationale for its use in COVID-19 pneumonia is along the same lines. In inhibition of this IL-6 receptor is effective in reducing many of the inflammatory sequelae of the other autoimmune disorders, which is why the shortage of tocilizumab in people who need it for treatment of systemic sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, and other autoimmune disorders is a particular problem. It too is available only in an IV formulation. It's been generally well tolerated in human clinical trials and clinical experience. It has a terminal half-life of ranging from 21 to 32 days, depending on the uh, concentrations it achieves in plasma and the disease that's being treated. It has no appreciable drug-drug interactions, but because of this long terminal half-life, it generally requires only one uh, administration uh, every three to four weeks, depending on the disease that's being treated. And in this case, too, where it's only a single dose being used. So the study that we're doing here at UCSD is a Roche-sponsored study of um, tocilizumab, and it has been uh, released by Roche for compassionate use in some settings. This um, slide illustrates one of the observational cohort studies that has been published out of China, looking at individuals with severe or critical COVID-19 pneumonia, severe meaning people on mechanical ventilation, and critical meaning in the ICU with uh, ARDS and multi-organ failure. And so these are the severest of the categories of disease. And all patients in this study received standard of care with tocilizumab. The dose was 400 milligrams given once. Um, some patients could receive a second dose 12 to 24 hours later if they did not have an initial response. And of the patients, in this observational retrospective study, all patients had their body temperature returned to normal on day one, their oxygen saturation improved in 71%, opacities in the lungs improved in 90% of individuals, and 90% of individuals were discharged from the hospital with no subsequent pulmonary infections, death, or adverse reactions reported. Obviously, this is a very small experience, and with the same cautionary note to the remdesivir uncontrolled observational study experience, this is a retrospective observational study with no control arm and a great deal of selection bias for individuals included in the cohort. Be that as it may, they reported reductions in CRP, and this just gives you a graphic depiction of improvements in 
CT scan before and after tocilizumab treatment in one of the patients followed in the study. So again, there appears to be at least some rationale and support for the use of this agent in COVID-19, but no ability based on our current knowledge to understand whether it's truly an active agent that's useful in reducing morbidity and mortality without well-controlled, well-designed placebo-controlled trials. So we're currently here doing the Roche study the um, number is listed here. It's a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled, multi-center trial. The total N for this one is 330. It's uh, the randomization. It's a two-to-one randomization. So two, two patients receive active drug for every one placebo. The study design is listed here. Patients get one dose of tocilizumab and or placebo and then are followed as per standard of care. The one additional dose may be given within 12 to 24 hours if the investigators and clinicians monitoring the patient feel it's warranted. And then patients are followed through the primary endpoint at day 28 or through and fully through to day 60. The, there is a stratification for patients on mechanical ventilation or not, or whether they're in the U.S. or outside of the U.S. There will be an interim data analysis for this study as well, so we may have early results depending on how rapidly it enrolls. The inclusion criteria are not too terribly different from those of the remdesivir trial. They have to be older than age 18, PCR positive for SARS-CoV-2, hospitalized with radiographic evidence of pneumonia, um, peripheral oxygen percent concentration of less than um, 93, per, less than or equal to 93%, so a little sicker than the remdesivir patients. And exclusion criteria are really active infection or other things that might interfere with the activity of tocilizumab a little bit more um, flexibility in terms of exclusion criteria for safety labs. Um, but like the remdesivir trial and other studies underway, people who are pregnant or lactating are not eligible. The primary efficacy endpoint in this study is um, clinical status based on a seven category ordinal scale at day 28. And uh, if you look at the secondary and primary um, objectives or endpoints, they really are quite similar to those also being evaluated in the remdesivir trial, but really looking at time to clinical improvement using this a new score and this seven category ordinal scale with um, secondary objectives being um, use of mechanical ventilation, ventilator-free days, organ failure, duration of ICU stay, clinical failure, and mortality. Safety endpoints are obviously evaluating adverse events, um, incidents and time to and severity of those, and then um, also looking at biomarkers of tocilizumab, PKPD, um, soluble IL-6 receptor levels, IL-6 itself, CRP, and ferritin. Enrollment began uh, just last week here at UCSD. There are two patients randomized at UCSD currently and others under an evaluation for enrollment um, at the present time. The total length of the study from screening of the first patient to the end of the study is expected to be approximately five months, but it will depend on how quickly other sites are up and enrolling patients and how quickly those patients enroll. The first efficacy interim analysis will be con conducted when approximately 75 patients reach the 28-day follow-up time and we'll be looking at mortality rate at that point as a secondary endpoint. So the last um, clinical trial I want to highlight in detail is the, that aimed at evaluating in a scientifically rigorous way hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. I borrowed these slides from Davey with a little bit of um, updating by myself, but Davey is the um, international uh, protocol chair for this study. 
and uh, conceived the design of the protocol. It is currently being conducted by the AIDS Clinical Trials Group Network, utilizing clinical research sites among that network, um, with UCSD being one of those clinical research sites. And the number is A5395 and referred to as the HAS-COVID trial. So what's the rationale? You've all heard just uh, voluminous um, reporting um, by uh, President Trump and other news media celebrities about the qualities of chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine and what a game changer this will be in treatment of COVID-19. And despite all of the noise, there is some rationale for the use of, of these compounds. Hydroxychloroquine blocks viral infection by increasing endosomal pH and therefore interfering with the viral cell fusion, that endocytosis and lysosomal fusion of the and unpackaging of the virus particle in the cytoplasm of the cell. It also has some modulatory uh, activity in the immune response and the activity of hydrochloroquine, hydroxychloroquine appears to be potentiated by azithromycin with azithromycin also having activity through its in ability to increase lysosomal pH which also interferes with the viral cell fusion um, uh, interaction. In uncontrolled studies in COVID-19 patients, hydroxychloroquine combined with azithromycin appeared to reduce the proportion of patients who had PCR positivity in respiratory samples by 95% over a six-day period. Um, this largely stems from a very early unpeer-reviewed um, experience released um, by a French study team and subsequently published in the International Journal of Antimicrobial Agents. And then a follow-up observational uncontrolled study also reporting 83% um, PCR negativity in nasopharyngeal swabs by seven days and 93% by eight days with culture negativity demonstrated five days into um, sampling in this group of 80 patients. Again, this is only reported in a WHO um, PAHO report, not published. It's an observational experience with no control group and really has um, been the sum total of what we know about the human clinical experience of activity against um, SARS-CoV-2. All of our current experience has been in observational, retrospective, and uncontrolled studies with a very small number of randomized um, placebo-controlled trials underway that haven't been fully evaluated in peer-reviewed manuscript, peer manuscripts. But the point being that there is a rationale for its antiviral activity and its use in clinical trials, but not a sufficient rationale for widespread use of this agent in clinical treatment. So what we're doing here in the study that Davy is leading is a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled multicenter trial. Patients are randomized one-to-one -to, -one to receive either hydroxychloroquine plus azithromycin or placebo for one week. So there's a one-week dose with the oral hydroxychloroquine and a Z-pack for five days or placebo. Um, this is followed by an intensive three-week evaluation post-treatment and then a 24-week follow-up um, for endpoints. The study is due to enroll 2,000 patients, 1,000 patients per arm, and is stratified by age and comorbidity. The primary objectives or endpoints of the study are to determine um, the ability of hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin to prevent a composite endpoint of either hospitalization or death by 21 days from study entry compared to placebo. There are a host of secondary objectives that are aimed at looking at adverse events, determining the um, viral clearance of SARS-CoV-2 RNA, 
looking at the severity and duration of self-reported symptoms, the composite endpoint of hospitalization or death by 24 weeks, and there is a subset of intensive sampling that will compare site-collected nasopharyngeal swabs with self-collected nasal swabs for detection of SARS-CoV-2 shedding. Exploratory objectives will also look at biomarkers, differences in outcome by subgroups, particularly um, by race and ethnicity, by sex, and by risk groups defined by age and comorbidities, and predict using those as predictors of outcome, something that we sorely need in the field in helping us understand how to intervene with this disease. Um, this is an outpatient study. Inclusion are, is based on patients having mild to moderate um, COVID-19 disease. Persons need to be greater than 18 years of age, laboratory confirmed SARS-CoV-2 infection. They must have at least one infection symptom uh, among the three listed here, and they have to be enrolled within 96 hours of a positive COVID-19. Um, SARS-CoV-2 test. That may sound like it's a, a daunting challenge from a logistical viewpoint, although our turnaround times have rapidly improved with testing. And with our testing sites and our COVID-19 outpatient clinic, we think we will be able to get patients in within that 96-hour period. Um, Unlike all of the other studies to date, women who are pregnant and breastfeeding are allowed because these agents have been safely used in that population. And the major exclusion is related to the potential for adverse events due to prolonged QT interval syndrome. So people who have ventricular arrhythmias or a history thereof uh, will not be allowed to enroll. And if patients are on drugs that um, are also known to have anti-SARS-CoV-2 activity, such as antiviral agents or drugs that are known to cause drug-induced prolonged QT syndrome will not be able to enroll. Um, SARS-CoV-2 vaccination prior to study entry, if vaccine studies come along, also will be an exclusion. There's this, I won't go into great detail, but list the data collection and sampling that will happen, but one point I want to make about how the study will be conducted is that it is deliberately intended to be a low touch or remote visit study because we don't want to put healthcare workers at risk or other people in the clinical settings in which we are evaluating patients at risk in an outpatient study. Um, we will be limiting in-person um, contact for most of the patients in the trial. The only major contact will be for those 100 participants who will undergo site-specific intensive sampling on days 0, 6, and 20 to undergo a nasopharyngeal swab collection. So participants will have telephone visits for the most part. They will be, um, those telephone visits will review study diaries daily symptoms, temperature, adherence to study medications, review the study endpoints, and after recovery by day 20 and later in the course of the study, um, in-person visits may be allowed. The main risks for short course hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin is the issue of prolonged QT syndrome and torsad de point. There are, is a considerable body of safety data from large malaria studies using this combination with chloroquine and azithromycin. And while those studies are different, or while those compounds, um, chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine are different, animal studies, toxicity studies, indicate that hydroxychloroquine is two to three times less toxic across a number of animal species. However, both molecules prolong the QT interval, and we need to balance the ability to provide safety for study personnel with the modest benefit of doing EKGs. So we will be excluding people who have concomitant medications that demonstrate a prolonged QT interval. Um, again, as we talked about staff safety in the context of conducting an in-person clinical trial in the outpatient setting will be important and key in, the, uh, in this study. 
during acute infection, as you know, patients with or persons with SARS-CoV-2 can shed billions of copies of virus in respiratory secretions. They can shed virus that can linger on fomites for uh, hours to days, depending on the fomite and the um, conditions. And therefore, we are maximally limiting participant contact. What we are planning to do at the ABRC with this study is actually conduct any in-person outpatient visits outside of the ABRC clinic. Um, we are going to be using our mobile van, which currently has a dead battery, but we're working on trying to fix it. But the van will be in our ABRC parking lot. We will be um, erecting a uh, covering tent so that we can shade the healthcare providers who are doing the testing. We have personal protective equipment um, that is recommended for anyone doing a nasal swab. So we'll have only one person who will do nasal swabs. Patients will, um, potential participants will be driving up to the van in their cars. They will stay in their cars with a mask they will remove their mask only for the short period of time to have the nasal swab, and then they will drive off. And be doing it outside will prevent, will allow the whatever um, virus may be excreted into the environment to quickly dissipate and not contaminate services inside the clinic and be hopefully more protective for any personnel that may be involved in swabbing the patients. Um, these are the primary outcomes, secondary outcomes, and exploratory outcomes. I won't go into these in great detail since we've already gone over them, but hospitalization and death by three weeks after enrollment and by 24 weeks after study entry are the major um, primary and secondary outcomes. And then again, looking at a number of other factors during the course of uh, follow-up. So this study also will have interim analyses built into it. There are three planned interim analyses after 25%, 50%, and 75% of enrolled participants um, reach the point of interim analysis. The first review may occur earlier than 500 par participants if we see an early indication of hospitalization or death across both combined study arms. Their interim analyses will look at both efficacy and futility. So I think this is one of the most rigorously designed of any of the trials um, that are ongoing with hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. And we're hopeful that we will be able to accrue it and have a reasonable answer to the question in a short period of time. So this is a busy slide now, but I don't want to finish by just showing the table that continues to expand of clinical trials that have been proposed for use at UCSD. The first three are the imminent, are the ones that are currently enrolling or imminently targeted to enroll. Um, there is an inpatient phase three randomized clinical trial of hydroxychloroquine plus azithromycin versus hydroxychloroquine versus placebo that is being sponsored by Novartis and also being conducted through AIDS clinical trials group sites. That's being led by Kathy Logan, Lucy Horton, and Susan Little from our division. And that study is still undergoing planning um, with uh, the study team a little back and forth be with the sponsor about the access that the sponsor is requiring to electronic medical records for monitoring of the study. And we're awaiting um, a decision about whether we'll be selected as a study site. Susan Little and Davy Smith are also leading a randomized clinical trial of the immunogenicity of uh, an oral vaccine from SibVivo, which I don't know all of the details about because I haven't seen the protocol document itself, but Susan can answer questions if she's on today but that is a vaccine versus placebo trial in healthy volunteers that is on its way to opening shortly and uh, will be the first of the vaccine trials that we'll be conducting here. 
Um, RAMIC, is, I just heard about for the first time on Wednesday, is a phase three randomized clinical trial that will evaluate safety and efficacy of Ramipril, an ACE2 inhibitor compared with placebo, and is an investigator-initiated trial being led by Rahit Lumba and Atul Malhotra and Davy Smith. And that will be for moderate COVID-19 um, patients who are hospitalized but not um, requiring intensive care unit or mechanical ventilation. And then Lalo Kashai has been leading uh, effort for evaluating convalescent serum for prophylaxis of high-risk exposure in healthcare professionals using plasmapheresis of serum from persons who've recovered from COVID-19. And he can answer questions about that trial and whether or not um, it will be started soon. It's anticipated to be done through the CTSA network, which of which our CTRI is a member and so likely will be um, through the CTRI. So I'm going to end there and just um, open it up for questions. If people want to take questions or write them in the chat room, we can take a look at those. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen um, for questions so that we can look at the chat room if anyone wants to write questions in. Connie, I, I just got a, oh, Doug, do you wanna speak? Yeah, or did that uh, just Tony, I, I, I have a comment and a question. First, I'd like to say that was a, a really excellent uh, informative summary. Um, the comment is just to uh, uh, say that uh, Gilead has two uh, multinational studies that are close to or maybe a week or two behind the, um, the DMID study, um, one in severe patients and one in um, uh, moderately ill patients. The uh, severe is five days versus 10 days, and the moderate is five, 10, and a placebo control. So those results should, I think, complement the DMID results. And uh, the first uh, DSMB meeting is, is next week. Um, so those results should be available soon. Um, the question is regarding the um, uh, uh, hydroxychloroquine azithro study, if they're getting the drug on day zero and you're doing a, a PCR, I may have missed it, but um, uh, is, how will you know that all the patients are, are positive? What proportion do you expect them to be positive? Oh, so yeah, you might have missed that, Doug. It, um, so they have to be um, PCR positive before they enter. So they're coming into the day zero already with a positive specimen. They'll be several days into their... Uh... Yeah, they have to get in, so they have to be tested. So we're planning to recruit from our um, drive-in testing sites, from our COVID-19 clinic, and referrals from the community for people that are known to have a positive test. But they have to get into the clinic for enrollment within 96 hours of that positive test. So not 96 hours of knowing about it, 96 hours of positivity. So they'll, we'll have to have um, evidence of positivity. We'll also be, um, as I, I I think I said 100 patients will be coming in in person to get nasopharyngeal swabs as well. But they, I think Davy is on the call, so Davy, Davy can maybe answer that question better than I can. Yeah, no, that, that's perfect. Uh, thanks, Connie. Uh, Doug, they just uh, will have 200 people who will have intensive sampling, so we'll have a better idea on nasal swabs and stuff. But the um, uh, entry, they have to have a positive nasal swab within 96 hours hopefully sooner. We have a bunch of questions that just came through. Um, one question is about um, the ability of UCSD and in San Diego to get tested and reliability and antibody testing. And I think that could be an entire That's talk. Yeah, entire <laughs> talk. Um, <laughs> so um, to that person, I, I will write you separately. And I actually think it's something we will probably bring into future talks because I know it's a really big question that a lot of people are asking. 
I have to hop off, but I think Marvin's going to go through the, the rest of the questions because a few came through. Marvin, are you okay to do that? Uh, yeah. Did you have already, um, did you go through all the ones that people sent you privately? Yes, that's the only private question I got. Okay. All right, great. Thanks, Marvin. So then, um, in the, yeah, no problem. So in the chat room, uh, Dr. Benson, I saw uh, Dr. Dr. Aldous asked about outpatients. You can yeah, see him? Okay. Yeah, I can see the chat room. So let's, cool. uh, so Nettie asked, how do we refer patients to the outpatient study? Um, maybe you can answer that, Mark. Davey already, Davey answered that one. Okay. At the he bottom. That one. Okay. <laughs> uh, question about antibodies. Um, how soon do antibodies appear after exposure to the virus? Uh, that's a, a question that a lot of people are asking in terms of antibody testing, but antibodies in general to most viral infections, you see an increase in IgM antibody within about two weeks. Um, and an IgG antibody follows shortly thereafter, peaking between two and four weeks. And IgG antibody is uh, supposed to be commensurate with also the appearance of neutralizing antibody, although the full characterization of the antibody response to SARS-CoV-2 is under intensive investigation right now. We do have pretty good surveys from uh, observational experiences of when in the course of disease people develop antibodies. We also know that people with more severe disease develop higher antibody levels, and that's kind of an intuitive finding we've seen with many other viral diseases. And the persistence, the duration of persistence of antibodies and the protective ability of antibodies to protect from reinfection, that's an open question. And we do believe that there's protective ability of IgG and neutralizing antibody, but we don't have enough experience yet with the long-term follow-up of people who've experienced COVID-19 disease to understand um, those dynamics and the actual protective activity. So next question was, do all the studies being conducted at UCSD allow people living with HIV to enroll? The answer to that is yes. Will one of the endpoints look at efficacy and immune response in people living with HIV? Um, I believe the answer to that is yes, but Davey can respond. Um, I'm sure we'll be looking at that as a subgroup, depending on how many, on whether we have enough people to answer that question. Um, Gigi Blanchard, um, who had a, maybe you can explain this a little further, but comment on studies of FTAF and healthcare workers. I'm not sure um, if I you're still. On. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm still on. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, I think Darcy had forwarded an email about some studies looking at either Truvada or Descovy in healthcare workers to, pro to prophylax them against, um, uh, against COVID. And I just, I didn't see any mechanism for that in your, in your presentation. So I just was, if you haven't yeah. heard of it, or maybe I have is on. I have seen no, maybe Doug and Davey, if they're on, still can answer that, but I've seen no in vitro yeah. data to suggest that those agents have activity. Yeah, there's no data, there's no in vitro data, but people are making these comments that people who have PrEP or these observations that people on PrEP have um, less significant uh, disease. I actually, what, what I think is going on is that those people who are on PrEP are probably younger and healthier and probably aren't just having the normal course of. Kobe too. Thank you. Okay. Um, Davey's answered some of these. Um, there's a question about how do researchers ethically test the efficacy of vaccines or PrEP type drugs designed to hinder infection after exposure to virus? Seems like you'd have to know that certain subjects were exposed and see whether they those who were exposed were on, t I'm not sure I understand, fully understand. I guess you're getting at the point of not deliberately exposing people. Maybe you're referring to the study in healthcare providers of um, convalescent plasma. 
Um, so no, nobody's being deliberately exposed. And um, I don't know exactly the construct of that study. Maybe if Lalo's on, he can answer that question. But um, the, the intent there is knowing that healthcare workers in the hospital who are treating people um, or who are working in the hospital and might not have had access to um, PPE at the time they were treating someone unknown to be positive would be an exposure. Um, hopefully we're not having a lot of that in our hospitals these days since everybody's being asked to wear masks, but um, I don't know if um, Lalo is on and can answer that question. Okay. Um, I didn't see any more um, questions come up, so if everybody, if you have additional questions, feel free to unmute yourself and ask them, but otherwise we can finish. Okay, thank you all for your attention, and uh, we'll talk to you next week. Bye.